Awesome, awesome. We got the message that we're live, but it's only, we'll see here if that's the correct thing. Letting people come in. Yes, we are live. Welcome everyone to our monthly event series, Ask an Estel Expert. It is so exciting to be with all of you once again on our Estel social media uh, Facebook channel. Um, we are so delighted to have two amazing Estel experts, um, multi-hyphenates, Again, they will talk more about themselves and we'll learn more about themselves. Uh, but we have Tom Burke here, who is an Estel mentor and course instructor based in New York. And uh, Kelly Burge, who is also an Estel mentor and co course instructor who got it over COVID, right? Who got uh, in quarantine, became an Estel mentor and course instructor. I was there for that, which was really exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, and she is based in California. Uh, my name is Luke Steinhauer. I'm the uh, customer experience manager and other things at Estel Voice International, as well as Carter Ellis is here with us, who's the administrative assistant and other Estel things Voice International, for Estel well Voice Carter International. Ellis is not, I'm hearing myself twice. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, this session is devoted to obviously all things voice, but specifically um, in voice in TV and film, as well as voice for professional speakers or just even just speaking life, because we know Estel is for everything and used in all different purposes. So I will turn it over to Carter, who will get us started with some questions, some introductions, and um, I'll be popping in, I'm sure. Go Amazing. Ahead, Amazing. Thank you, Luke. Hello, everyone on the Facebook world. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Like Luke was saying, we have two incredible experts with us today. Um, we have Kelly Kelly Burke, who's uh, once again multi hyphen. It is the name of the day, the name of the game today. Everyone, like these two people, have done absolutely everything. You can probably, maybe recognize Kelly from League of Legends, which I think is really cool. I mean, professional voice actor. She was a, a professor. She's uh, does courses on pop music and speaking. Has a million theater students. Say hello to everyone, Kelly. Hello from California. Yes, amazing, amazing. And then of course we have Tom Burke, licensed speech language pathologist and EMCI like we were talking about. And he has the Belt for Days program for singers as well as the Concise on the Fly for speakers. And um, uh, once again, a million other things. This is the subnote, the subnote of the resume, everyone. Say hello to everyone, Tom. Hey folks, thanks for having me. Amazing. So welcome, welcome. So like Luke was saying, this is all about professional speaking as well as voice and voiceover and um, uh, TV work. So I would love, first things first, as we kind of have started to do for these, is I would love to know both of your processes about coming to Estel, you know, finding out about it, as well as the process of becoming an EMCI, which obviously is a different journey for every single person. So I would love to hear about that. Why don't we start with you, Kelly? Oh, goodness. Uh, I met Jo Estel in 1995, uh, personally, and I got to know her. She had just moved out to California. And uh, I had been a music major in college. I studied piano and composition and voice. And uh, I just wanted to be a pop singer. Uh, that was it. You know, I, that was the, my goal. And um, when I met Joe, it was like, where were you a decade ago? <laughs> you know, I was singing in clubs in the Bay Area and, and just having a great time, but really felt limited in my voice. And so um, I met her at a conference and Honestly, my world turned upside down from there. I could, I was one of those people who just couldn't stop talking about this really cool set of tools, you know? So um, that was the start. Uh, then, uh, goodness, uh, I, since I had Joe out here, I didn't really pursue licensure because I would just pick up the phone and talk to her. Um, and she was so generous with her time. And so um, I taught uh, voiceover, did a lot of things like that. Um, Voiceover was a weird thing that I stumbled into after I met Joe. Uh, my kid's dad was working at the learning company and all of their actors, computers were speeding up. All their actors suddenly had to sing. They were putting music in the game. So I started getting phone calls saying, hey, we've got this character in here and they have to belt the high F sharp. Um, can you help them do it in a minute or less? So it forced me to come up with really fast things that would work on the fly. Uh, and then they noticed how much I was saving them. And so I started doing things like analyzing character voices, what pitch ranges did they speak in and what were they doing? So I used all the Estel tools to figure it out. 
Um, but it was a lot of fun. And the next thing I knew, they started hiring me to come in uh, because I was saving time. So I got into voiceover by coaching it on the other side of the microphone. Um, and then I started doing pickup lines. Um, like I said, bears, marbles, mice, you know, things like that. Um, and the next thing I know, I had an agent and I did voiceover for about a decade. So, and there's a whole bunch from there, but um, Joe was really just the initial catalyst of giving me a whole set of tools and changing the way I thought about sound and the way I thought about voice. Hmm. And then you recently just became an EMCI, right? I did. Boy, it's been a long time. So that was, it was 95 when I met Joe. And so then I got my EMT. Oh, I don't know. I'm losing track of the years around 2010. <laughs> Finally went back and got my EMCI. Um, and that was after I'd been a college professor for um, five years mm -hmm. and had written a curriculum to teach Estel as the foundation for vocal understanding and vocal science in a uh, musically and culturally diverse music major. That was the whole point. So coming up with uh, a standard of excellence that could be applied to a university system using Estel, but it was a lot of fun. That's all I can say. Just a lot of fun creating something that would help people fan the flame of their spark to life. So oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, it's 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 always interesting to hear people who have been in Estel for a while who then become EMCI, like a really seasoned professional. I mean, especially you teaching at a collegiate level as well as private students and then really the EMCI thing, like that's just the next step. Congratulations, that's absolutely incredible. Thank you. So same question over to you, Mr. Tom Burke. How did you get introduced to this, this crazy Estel system? How did you become an Estelian? Yes, I think, I think my journey began around 1997 when I was a junior in college and I was taking an in, uh, independent study class where I was just working on one vocal topic as part of my speech pathology training and I was supposed to focus on what is the singing voice and I, I think I was a little naive to think that like you can even answer that question because <laughs> <laughs> I clearly could find resources on what was preferred western classical recipes but in terms of like what how do you define the rest of all the sounds that we can make and i was very confused and very interested in that and that's where uh, early on in google days i think google was barely around then i discovered uh, the um, estel work and so i was remember being fascinated by the symbols I'm like what do those symbols mean like what are all these parts that talking about and well, i didn't get it at all and i remember emailing Julie Fortney, I think, who was a, uh, a Vanguard licensee back at the time, I think before there were terms like EMCI, and asking, like, how long does it take to get certified? Thinking it was one of these three-day weekend courses or something, like a three days to get certified. And she, and she politely replied that it wasn't about that. And that began my journey. And my first course was at Mars Hill, hmm. North Carolina, with Mary Klimek. Hmm. And soon after that when i was when i was a speech pathologist i was working at a head and neck cancer center and mm -hmm. actually had mary to our hospital organization and what was cool about that course was that we would do the figures and the standard slides but in lieu of breakout groups we would go into the clinic and scope each other doing the figures under endoscopy and so that kind of sealed the deal for me with, with estel at that point, and it's informed my career since then, helping folks with uh, vocal injuries or, or helping people who don't have injuries get faster results in singing different styles. And uh, I think I've been an EMCI for, I don't even remember, I think 10 years now. Uh, and it's now I'm focusing more on certifying or working through a certification pathway with folks. So it's kind of mm -hmm. where I currently am my journey. Oh. That's incredible. The I, I would kill to have taken a course and have like a cohort of people scoping each other to see it. That is, yeah. that's next level. I mean, that's some, that's some voice nerd stuff. We, we have those old videos on YouTube. I'll have to share them with everyone, yeah. Absolutely, please attach me to that email, I'm obsessed. Um, okay, so now that we've kind of got your, your basis for the both of you, 
this we were talking about, or this is about um, professional speaking as well as voice and voiceover and things like that. But I want to ask a question about professional speaking. I mean, Tom, I was noticing on your website. I mean, you're coaching people at Google, TED Talks, left and right. Kelly also has a course about like professional speaking and authors and female executives, all incredible things. So, my my question, I have a couple questions, but my first question would be, like, what's the main thing? Or if there's like a certain focus uh, towards speak speakers that seems to be missed with especially executives, people who aren't really singers that you think Essel really taps into well. Like for being heard, understood. Tom, you can take this one first if you'd like. Great. Um, so over the course of the years coaching speakers, I did realize I, I used to I used to start with voice first hmm. and then realized just like with acting, you can't act your way out of bad writing necessarily. <laughs> so any sort of vocalizing stuff I put on top of it, if the writing wasn't working, we had to address that first. And so I, I didn't expect this to happen, but I became more of a writing coach at first. And it was once we got clear about the words that then folks were able to articulate that more authentically, then we could really dive into some of the nitty gritty details about their voice. And within that, I realized that I used to throw a lot at people or presume that their sensory awareness or their understanding of their voice was further along than they might be. Because I was used to working with professional singers and actors, but in the corporate speaking environment, some of those folks may have never been exposed to lots of the things that we just take for granted. The idea of ask, asking the question, what do you feel or what do you notice? is not necessarily intuitive to all people on how to answer that if they right. don't identify as artists first. Right. So in using some of the Esther work, I really had to identify the ones, the, the figures and the prompts that would elicit the fastest magic trick to whet their appetite for beginning their vocal journey. And so in playing around with them, I, I did notice that Anchoring really comes up a lot as something that's easily feelable mm -hmm. for folks, and they can clearly sense the transformation between relaxed and anchored when they are trying to project, when they're trying to get through the day, when they are trying to embody more executive presence. So time and time again, when I ask people what they gleaned most uh, beneficial from the workshops, that I'll be doing with them is they love saying things like, oh, I just I just press my hands on the table or just pull up on the pull up on my chair and my, my <laughs> voice gets better. <laughs> I'm like, great, that's like minute one of hour <laughs> one in the day one of, of our mm -hmm. larger journey. But it's it's good that, that it starts their journey with that kind of seminal uh, work. <laughs> I love that. It's isn't it always how it goes. You'll teach them for three weeks and they'll be like, well, the prompt you said the first the first day really stuck with me. I'm like, yes. after three, yeah, all that time they say, you know, flare, flaring your nostrils really works. <laughs> I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. But you know, I do I do remember because there was an old book, was it the primer or the primer? How did, there's a Joe's sort of like little spiral notebook. Mm -hmm. And anchoring and retraction used to be bucketed under pre-phonatory gestures, kind of before there was this idea of um, no preconceived notions of how you're supposed to do things. It was uh, clearly it's not as prescriptive as, as it may have once been. Mm -hmm. But I did like the idea that for corporate folks who do want something that is um, not formulaic, but step-by-step, -step, like do these three things, right. it is helpful to kind of come back to that idea that there are certain pre-phonatory gestures like head and neck anchoring, torso anchoring, and retraction that do set you up for vocal success when you're trying to speak for prolonged periods of time without getting tired. Mm. Very cool. Love that. Love that. Okay. Same question to you, Kelly, before I, I, I have a million follow-ups, obviously, but Kelly, what do you think? Same kind of, same question. Is there, is there uh, an area that you're thinking like, or you're seeing like really this is the things that they're needing for professional speakers. Um, I do a lot of work with retraction uh, because that's actually how I stumbled into getting an agent. 
um, I answered the phone and Joe told me, you know, practice your retraction every time you answer the phone, because I have this habit of kind of constriction slack, the West coast thing, you know, California chill dude, which doesn't really come across very professional. So I'm like answering the phone all retracted. Hi, it's Kelly Burge. How can I help you? And it was, uh, oh, we have a medical read. Would you try it? So, you know, that led to, I don't know, diabetes drugs or something like that, that I was reading. But um, I found that for many people, retraction is a big deal. And then I have a series of prompts to work with larynx height and how Mm -hmm. that correlates with pitch. Um, Because, you know, especially with female executives, if we let the pitch rise up, we're working against a lot of acoustics. And the next thing you know, we lose a lot of our authority. So um, I have some, you know, a series of prompts to take us through all of that. Um, And that came out of a course that I wrote for the college called uh, Voice for Digital Media. Mm -hmm. Um, When I realized that how we speak communicates more than what we say. Mm -hmm. And that was really eye-opening. There was these incredible students at the college that'd be like, sup, dude, I got a master's degree from this great college, you know? And you're like, this doesn't, (laughs) this doesn't befit your education. So, um, you know, that started a whole process of investigating um, what we do with our voice and how that communicates who we are to the rest of the world. Wow. Wow. Very well said. Okay. And um, if anyone, if anyone on Facebook has a question for our two experts, please pop them into the chat and I will absolutely ask them. But until then, I'm going to continue with my own personal studies because I have questions. So in, in saying in the professional speaking realm, do you, both of you find that it's, it's helpful, Tom kind of spoke about this for a moment, helpful to just kind of spotlight certain things like focus on these three main issues, or do you think it, it also um, has merit to kind of give them a whole, this is everything your voice can do and make sure you have a little bit more knowledge that way. Do you think it's better spot check or a little bit more general knowledge like course one and course two? Pelly, what do you think? Um, I do more of a spot check. Um, There there are certain things uh, we work on clarity and variety. The two things that the human brain craves when we're listening to someone. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we work on ways of creating that uh, and things that engender trust uh, from a listener. So um, there's certain prompts that, that will engender trust and other ones that will really be Mm -hmm. off-putting. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much how I go about it. Um, I've, I've tried the other side and it's, I find it's more effective. You have to be able to think on your feet as an executive and you you can't be thinking every single piece of the anatomy. You have to have prompts that work in the moment. Right. Okay. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I've been using a lot of the spirit of the law of Estelle with folks. So the idea that there is a figure and there are conditions and prompts within that. So for Mm -hmm. example, playing around with intonation, it isn't necessarily an Estelle figure, but you can help people find kind of plains, hills, and mountains as their three conditions, or rate, so slow, medium, fast. And even giving people a sense of kind of a couple buckets of things that they can play around with two to three variables helps them organize their brain around this stuff and also makes it a little more doable so they have a very clear practice pattern. So I think of the spirit of the vocal variables or where Estel would meet with sort of viewpoints and other Mm -hmm. work, I think is a good way of um, translating into folks who think in Venn diagrams and uh, (laughs) frameworks. So I tend to work with lots of tech folks. And so they need it very specific and very uh, mapped out in a very clear way. So that, that translation has really helped. Nice. This makes me think of the most recent ESSEL research report with Dr. Rockford Sampson, where he talked about people um, teaching people who are either like more of a hippie mindset, who just kind of want to feel it, you know, metaphorical singing, as opposed to nerd singing, who was like, or speakers who are like, what's exactly happening? Why am I doing this? How is this working? And so it's interesting to hear that that predominantly like professional speakers, executives, it actually is on the other side of like, just kind of focus on these prompts to get the desired effect to not overthink. That's and, really and, Right, and isn't it great? Again, the main principle of Estel voice training is hear, see, feel, or not in that order, but feel, see, hear, right? 
if one doesn't work, you try another. If another doesn't work, you try another. The goal is that obviously we can have all of these um, and, and they can work all in tandem, but it gives us different ways in, um, certainly for feelers, seers, or hearers. Um, let's go to the chat. For, for some questions here and, they're, and they are rolling in. But this is a great question because we've talked a lot about professional speaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to talk about uh, this one. I've only worked as a vocal music teacher. What are the qualifications and specs people usually look for in a voice for acting coach? What's different? Mm, good question. Well, do you want to start, Tom? <laughs> and is there a difference? Right. Well, you know what? These these days, I mean, I think the world is very different now mm -hmm. in a good, in a positive way. And now more than ever, no aesthetic bias mm -hmm. uh, has got to be part of the conversation. And so, but folks who often pursue services are still looking for the teacher to offer something. They, they uh, want to change their voice in some way. And so... I think there isn't necessarily a difference between the singing voice and the speaking voice. It's more like what, what is the task required to get through this particular context? And let's pause to talk about some of the issues. And then the Castilian is then thinking through the lens of figures to say, okay, based upon what they're saying, what is their attractor state? And based upon what they're saying, what's the goal where is the mismatch uh, that we can work on versus this sort of uh, sort of guru way of saying, this is the way you have to do it. It's right, more right. like conversational based. So I think um, that's not to say that I don't have aesthetic biases, right? So when the people, right. after you've gone through that conversation, people say, well, great. And you have a relationship with them. And I can still then say, here are my preferences. Mm -hmm. Here are ways that I find do help me. Would you like to try those on for size? Mm -hmm. And so I think the difference between singing and speaking is the same, but the difference between the way I was taught and the way we are all as a community trying to teach is vastly different. Yes. Well said. Kelly, what do you think? Um, I find it is very similar. Um, because my first work in voiceover was analyzing character voices, so cartoon character voices, and then saying, realizing they spoke within a range and that there was a melody and a pitch and a timbre. And it was like, it was literally like analyzing music, what the character would do. And then creating, working with the composers to write music that followed those same formats. So Esto gave me the tools to try to figure that out. Uh, I think I was the only weirdo doing that kind of stuff at the time. Um, but then that really gave me a format that I work with executives with. Um, and so like in the course at the college, we started by playing. We did, we, it wasn't a lot of analysis. It was like character voices and really just, um, we read Dr. Seuss books together. Um, and uh, the first time that, you know, somebody walked through my li living room and they heard somebody reading Dr. Seuss, and then I said, oh, yeah, that person has, you know, like three PhDs and they're getting ready to present at the Pentagon next week. I think they were blown away. Like, and you're doing Dr. Seuss. And I said, yeah, because we have to get we have to get over ourselves and get playing and let our voice express who we truly are and what our ten intent is, you know. Um, and they were looking for lots of analytical. And I think the analytical would have gotten in the way. So instead, I took the Estel and package it differently in the hear, see, feel. I think there would be another quadrant, hear, see, feel, play, you know, or explore, because that was what Joe was all about. Try this, you know, <laughs> that she was always trying new things. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I, I tend to approach it from kind of a, a play mindset. Um, yeah. I, love I agree. That. I think, you know, that's where starting with qualities for folks who are earlier in their vocal journey actually often works better because it, they're bigger contrasts. So differentiating vertical thyroid from thyroid tilt is sometimes really hard for people, but differentiating twang from sob is a little bit more, the contrast is easier. So I totally agree, Kelly, that starting from a place of bigger contrasts and play and then getting down to the figures. So it's almost like quality figure quality 
seems to be a great way to, to play. And that's why and the question came from someone asking about being a vocal music educator. Armed with the knowledge of the figures, that's really what are, you need. That's all you need in that way. And I think it is because the voice is the voice is the voice is the voice in that way. Okay. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Um, let's, let's get one more Estel specific question here and we're gonna go deep in Estel specific. What uh, figures do you use for public speakers? Um, especially like what, what um, options are you using? So somebody said mainly AES or AES narrow might help with clarity. What other, we said anchoring mm -hmm. from Tom, other helpful Estel specific figure options. Um, gosh, I think I use all of them. Um, you know, it kind of depends if, if it depends on what the script says. If it says we want somebody that's next door with texture, I'm going to throw in some slack, you know, because we're just going to talk girlfriend to girlfriend, you know, it's about something really sweet. Um, or, but if it's authoritative, the larynx height and vocal fold thickness and retraction, these things are very important as we speak about them, you know, so you can kind of hear those timbres uh, and the changes with it. Anchoring is helpful, but every, everybody's a little different. Some people constrict when they anchor right at first. So it's, you know, using your estal ears uh, and then using your common sense. Um, but interesting, like in our class, we, um, there was the last time I taught in person before the pandemic, the democratic primaries, do you remember those? Those were out. And I had the students just rate people on their voice. No content, no gestures. They had to listen to the, the debate without watching. And interesting, I wish it had been a scientific study. It was the exact order that people dropped out of the race. Hmm. Wow. And um, there's, so as much as we play with it, there's a lot at stake. There's hmm. a lot at stake in how people perceive what we have to say. So um, very important, very important to go into that. Um, but yeah, that was just kind of a, <laughs> uh, you know, I, as, as, the months went on and things played out. It was just so interesting. I went, I wonder if they're next. And sure enough. So our voice, I think it sneaks under the radar mm -hmm. um, and communicates to people in ways that we may not be aware of at all times. Wow. That is very interesting. Wow. Mm. Tom, um, what, what about you? You yeah. mentioned anchoring specifically, but like I anything think else? I always start because, because I'm working more with corporate speakers who have, they're working with uh, the writing they've given, they're not necessarily actors in that way. So mm -hmm. it, I work with actors and singers separately, but from the corporate speakers, I would say it's kind of three main things. Most comfortable vocal effort and attractor states first, mm -hmm. meaning they might even not even have the words to describe what they're experiencing, let alone then be able to process. And I'm not saying that they're unintelligent, it's just a whole new world for lots of folks. Mm -hmm. So. I like to think about or help them identify where they're already operating from a place of most comfortable vocal effort and use that as a reference point to get them to do more of that. Hmm. Then we can start playing with three main things. I say speaking is an art. So anchoring, retraction, and twang. So head and neck and torso anchoring helps them find alignment, get neutral. We do mindfulness and breathing, finding a comfortable effort with their breath. Just, I, I roll that under anchoring. And then retraction is finding that hint of a smile in there. And then the twang, I use that, I collapse AES narrowing and the quality of twang in that way, right? So for their, for their purposes, find more meh in there. Mm -hmm. And so once they feel like they're easy and they're projectable, then the third thing is playing around with the preferred level of darkness. And I try to use their lips to teach their larynx where to go. So, because sometimes it's hard to, for a, a person new to the work to control their laryngeal position. Mm -hmm. But if you have them play with their lips first and say, can you emulate that same sound without using your lips? They sometimes intuitively can match their own voice with their larynx. And so that's the bonus feature is playing around the preferred level of darkness. So we always start with most comfortable vocal effort, ART, and then the bright dark ometer with the uh, emphasis on lips. That's awesome. I love that ART. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep that in my mind. And also, like I love 
I love, we were kind of speaking about this right before we went live, but how Essel is just this, it, this common language, you know, it's all coming back to the figures. Like you, I, you can deliver it in a lot of different packages based on the learner that you're working with or based on speaker, singer, musician, non-musician. It all comes back to the same root principles. Like Tom, I love the way you put it. It's the, it's the Latin for the voice. It's the uh-huh. root language. And Kelly was telling me, yeah, yeah, yeah. To sell the foundation of all of this, which is the model, which is the Estel voice model. And we are all beneficiaries of it, Joe's work and the continuing work that has been done. And uh, Estel Voice International has released a uh, self-directed online learning course called Foundations of Estel Voice Training. And if you, uh, you know, this is your first time to Estel Voice, uh, it, it might be a great place to start um, and one of the many places to start. That, um, and uh, that is on estelvoice.com. And you can hit online academy and you will see the course there, which is on sale through the end of this month, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, So we are actually at the end of our Ask an Estel expert session. Thank you, Tom and Kelly, so much for being here uh, with us all and sharing your experience and expertise and all that good stuff. Um, We are excited next month that is December to be hosting um, a musical theater focused Ask the Estel Expert. I can never get this name. (laughs) Uh, We're going to have Steve Tickerel Stein and Tara Snyder, both from Florida, um, talking about musical theater and Estel. And um, we are, what is the date on that, Carter? Do we know specifically? Yes, I have it right here. My head. Yes, it is. December 16th. December 16th, there you have it. Um, And before we go, uh, I wanted to use this time to announce to our Facebook audience um, that we are hosting, Astle Voice International is hosting a North American summit in New York City, where both uh, Carter and Tom and I are, we're all in New York, but we will be in New York City next summer, June 2022. I can't believe I'm even saying that. Uh, June 25th and 26th, last weekend in June, we'll be at a beautiful art gallery exploring our voices and seeing Estel in action across many, many different mediums. Um, we'll have uh, actually everybody in this chat in this uh, Zoom room here at the summit. Uh, so Tom and Kelly will both be there. Um, we will also have Joan Later. We will have um, Scott Sussman from Wild Cornell. Um, we will have oh my God, I'm forgetting. There's so many, many more, many, many more. What you need to do is hit that link in the uh, chats, which will take you to the North American Summit landing page where you can learn more, see the price, see when it is, and hopefully you can join us. Again, this is open to all Estel Voice trainers and the general public. So you uh, do not have to be a North American trainer to be there. Um, I will share this fun video and then we will say goodbye. for a, a New York, New York, uh, <laughs> like that Alicia Keys song. Um, anyway, um, we hope that we will see you in uh, New York City next June. Uh, we hope that we will see you at our next ex- Ask an Estel Expert session with Tara and Steve Musical Theater. And um, until then, folks, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day, morning, evening, whatever time it may be where you're at. Yes. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Kelly. This was awesome. Thanks, folks.